Hi, my name is Guy Wallace, and in this pack video short, we're going to discuss the Crickham Architecture Design Design Team meeting. PAC is an acronym. It stands for Performance Based, Accelerated, Customer and Stakeholder Driven, Training and Development of Any Blend. In the Curriculum Architecture Design meeting, there are seven basic steps that the facilitator takes the design team through. The design team members are all members of the analysis team so that the analysis data that they'll be working with is all familiar with the exception of the assessments of existing training. The first step in this is to establish the training and development path. You can see on the table in the diagram that the table has been divided into B, M, and E. That stands for beginning, middle, and end. And even though the training and development path might end up with four or five or ten phases later on, it always starts off with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Establishing that allows the sorting of the analysis data. Again, as mentioned previously, the beginning of the path is always considered to be the onboarding content. And in the middle and the end are the intermediate and advanced skills that one would learn after the onboarding period. Establishing the training and development path involves discussing and creating shared understanding across the entire design team as to what do we mean by the beginning of the path and onboarding? How long might that take? If we were to guess before we started sorting any of the data, would we guess that to be half a day, a full day, several days, several weeks, a month, six months, or what? Once that's established, then you can define the middle of the path. So how long might we take in developing the learners and performers further before we get to the end of the path? Establishing these time frames is somewhat arbitrary, but oftentimes I've found that groups know exactly how long that's going to take. An example might be that beginning of the path, that onboarding, that's got to be the first week on the job. And then the middle starts after that first week and ends after the first year. And the end of the path is from the first year's anniversary until the end of the career. I've had groups do that, so they often feel very comfortable about that. And if they're not quite on the same page, it doesn't take them very long to establish a reasonable time frame for each of these elements. It's especially important that they know that they can divide this into four or five paths later on. This is just to assist us with the preliminary sorting of the data, which begins in step two, where we sort the performance model data where we have outputs and measures and tasks and roles and responsibilities and all the gap information associated with an output. And we can decide where is the very first output of the very first area of performance and where does that go on the training and development path? Where will we teach that? Up front in the beginning or in the middle or in the end? A typical curriculum architecture design project might have 20 to 30 to 40 individual clusters of outputs and tasks and performance data, including the gap data, that one can sort and decide which of these go in the onboarding where somebody's going to have to learn this right away. These are the immediate survival skills. They've got to have this before they even take the job, before they take the floor, before they take the wheel, before they fly the airplane. And there are other outputs and task performance that can be learned afterwards. Unless, of course, the job is like an airline pilot where you've got to actually know all of it before you actually take the job. So there are some exceptions where this sorting mechanism and talking about onboarding and learning just so much before you actually take the job and learning the rest of it over time, where that's not possible, where that's not feasible, where that's not real. The design team will steer you in the correct direction on this. Once all of that analysis data is sorted, one could actually step back and say, we have the entire path created. That's how we're going to teach the job. This is what we teach first in the beginning. This is what we teach in the middle. And this is what we teach at the end. We're done. However, we have all this other analysis data. We've assessed existing training for its appropriateness for reuse. Now that the path is anchored by performance, we could decide where will we teach the various existing content 
that we assessed. If we have something on active listening, well, where will that go? Where do you first in the performance learn active listening or use active listening? And so therefore, where would we put the active listening content? Well, we would put it as close to possible and just in front of the first performance where you actually would use active listening. All of the existing training that's assessed can then be sorted onto the path once that path is anchored by all the performance data. The third sort is to take all of the knowledge and skill matrices data, which is in step four, and now sort that. The way the knowledge and skills data was collected in the analysis phase linked each knowledge and skill item back to an area of performance that had one or more outputs. All of that data is now on the table, so now we can take each knowledge and skill item that enables performance and tee it up, so to speak, immediately before that performance. So if I didn't have active listening content as is to be used, and it's a gap, but I have it as enabling knowledge and skills, I can look down on the table at the path that's being produced and find the first place where active listening enables task performance to produce outputs. And then I would tee up that content immediately before that performance data. Once all of that data, 20, 30, 40 pieces of performance data, dozens or dozens and dozens of existing training assessment data has been sorted onto the table, onto the path and perhaps hundreds and hundreds of individual knowledge and skill items have been sorted onto the path appropriate to the performance that anchors it all, one can then begin to accumulate the content into modules. Starting at the beginning of the path, one would take the performance data and the enabling knowledge and skill data and perhaps some existing training data and decide which of this is going to go into a chapter, a module. What makes sense given our target audience and what makes sense given the fact that we may want to segregate some of this content because other target audiences in the enterprise might need A but not B. And so we wouldn't want to put A and B together. We might want to put two different chapters, an A chapter and a B chapter, because perhaps another target audience can use the B chapter content, but not the A. So as we modularize the content, we're looking system-wide, enterprise-wide, in terms of all the target audience that we might be expected to address in the future and start modularizing for them. Once we have modularized all of the content into the various chapters of the books, so to speak, we can then go and accumulate that content further into the events. So again, starting at the beginning of the path, which of these modules go into the first event. The first module goes in the first event. The question becomes, does the second module also go into that event? Maybe it does or it doesn't, and the third module might go into the event. So now we're accumulating content, trying to make sure that we adhere to proper sequencing. Who assesses proper sequencing? The master performers on the design team. They know what you've got to know before you can learn something else. They understand the sequence of prerequisites. They understand where it would hurt to be out of sequence and where it really won't. We're utilizing the expertise and knowledge of the master performers that generated the analysis data in the design team to make decisions that are typically made by instructional designers who really never understand all the nuances of the content well enough to really make the right decision often enough. I've been practicing, publishing, and presenting on these methods since 1982. My recent book, Six Pack, covers all of this in great detail.